Hi everyone, I'm Shelly and you're watching There's No Place Like Home. I am going to apologize in advance for the audio because all of a sudden my computer is not recognizing my mic and I have no idea why, but I wanted to talk to you today in this question the narrative video about the lost generation. This was actually brought to my attention by someone in the comments. So Ruth, thank you very much. I had never heard of this before. And so many of the things that I present to you were actually shared with me by other people. So I want to thank all of you who have left me information. Sometimes it's overwhelming the amount of information that I get, but it's always appreciated. So the lost generation actually fits in perfectly with what I've been talking about in a lot of these videos about the 1890 anomaly is what I call it. It seems that so many things happened around the year 1890, maybe 1880s up to early 1900s. It just seems that there was some sort of, yeah, dare I say it, reset where things just seem to start over anew. And it just so happens that the generation of people living between 1883 and 1900 are called the lost generation. And, you know, I've talked about that. I've talked about, I've called the people the inheritors and trying to figure out why people seem so out of place and why there are so many children that don't have families in this time period. And even though it tells us something different than what I'm thinking of for the lost generation, for the meaning of it, um, I we always know that there's usually more to the story. But so what it tells us the lost generation is, it was the social generational cohort that was in early adulthood during World War I. Lost in this context refers to the disoriented, wandering, directionless spirit of many of the war survivors in the early post-war period. So that's how why it's saying that the, the people born between 1883 and 1900 are called the lost generation because of the, the World, World War I that was going on. But if you actually look at the definition of lost, there are, you know, several very similar meanings, but some of them are not made use of, won, or claimed, no longer possessed, no longer known. That one to me seemed very interesting. Um, ruined or destroyed physically or morally, taken away or beyond reach or attainment. And to, yeah, taken away is another one that it makes me scratch my head. Um, insensible, hardened, unable to find the way, no longer visible, lacking assurance or self-confidence, and there's several others. But anyway, so let's, before I get into what I'm looking at as the lost generation, let's talk about a little, just for a little bit, because I have mentioned this several times before, why I think that this time period is so extremely interesting. So I noticed in my own town where I live, this is not my town, this is just the, the screen that I have up right now, but in my other videos where I talked specifically about the town where I live, I also noticed in my own town that it seems that a lot of things first really started happening around here around the 1890s or maybe the, the 1880s. Um, a lot of the buildings were first built around that time or maybe around 1900, even though the, the town was founded in the 1700s. Um, I. I was reading the records of a historian who said that they didn't really keep records before the 1880s or the 1890s. And even then I thought to myself, why does it just seem like, like things are first happening now when they were supposedly happening long before? And it's not just my town. You can look up so many instances of events from all over the world. And a lot of them seem to be centered around that 1890 year, not specifically 1890 always, but somewhere in that vicinity. So, and a lot of the strange things that I've talked about here seem to be centered on here. So I, I mentioned this one before, this is underground Eureka Springs. According to local history, two major streets in downtown Eureka Springs underwent considerable re-engineering in the year 1890. Main Street was the first official street in town built in a low-level gulch alongside a small spring-fed creek. It suffered from frequent runoff problems and quickly earned the nickname Mud Street. And so I had mentioned this in a mud flood video, hence the need for improvements. So what basically happened was that there was an, there's an underground town. They built one town on top of the other, and you will notice that, you know, 1890 seems to be the year that they decided to do this. 
Another interesting thing around that time was the Johnstown flood. And I could be here all day going over things that happened around this time. But if you're interested, just go through some different things that happened throughout history and take pay attention to the time because you will find that it's not hard to find things that are happening at this time. And it always seems to be life-changing events. So anyway, here's the Johnstown flood, the Great Flood of 1889 occurred on Friday, May 31st, 1889, after the catastrophic failure of the South Fork Dam located on the South Fork of the Little Conemaugh, I don't know how to say that, river upstream, upstream of the town of Johnstown, Pennsylvania. The dam ruptured after several days of extremely heavy rainfall, releasing 14.55 million cubic meters of water. And so a lot of times the things that you see happening around the year 1890 involves some sort of destruction. So back over here, you know, they, they talked about um, it was from the runoff of a creek and it had the name Mud Street. And unfortunately, I don't think that you can zoom in on that picture. But destruction. Destruction seems to be a common theme around this time. Here we have the Seattle Underground, which you can actually visit now. And I again, I mentioned this one in a, a video or two. I'll leave links to all of these. Um, posts, articles in the description box. But the, the main point of this, because I really do just want to get back to the lost generation, is, yeah, a lot of really strange things happen around this time. So in the mid-19th century, these structures were on the ground level and all the buildings were made of wood. And that actually doesn't make sense because they're showing you the underground here, and that's not wood, that's brick. They're telling you that it's made of wood because it has to go with the whole everything burned down because of everything was made of wood. But if you look at this, that surely doesn't look like wood to me. That's brick. Anyway, however, most of them, so they're talking about the buildings, most of them were destroyed in the Great Seattle Fire on June 6, 1889. That day, sometime after 2.30 in the afternoon, a cabinet maker and employee in Victor Claremont's woodworking shop accidentally forgot the glue that he was heating over a gasoline fire. The glue boiled over and caught fire, very easily spreading to the floor covered in turpentine and wood chips. In the ensuing chaos, John tried to extinguish the fire with water, which made it even worse because the water thinned the turpentine and spread the fire even more. Everyone inside got to get out of the building in the nick of time, but by the time the fire department came to the scene, the fire was out of control. The abundance of smoke made it impossible for the firemen to trace the source of the fire. On top of that, precisely that day, the fire chief happened to be out of town, so convenient, and the volunteers who came to the scene made a mistake of using too many hoses at once, and this led the water pressure to drop completely. And again, what you're seeing here is an underground building and again, that doesn't look like wood. That looks like brick, but we're told that everything burned down because it was wood. But the main point of this is 1889, and we always hear some outlandish story of how these things happened. And it always just, there always happens to be some coincidence like the fire chief being out of town. Okay, so here we have the mystery of why Chattanooga raised its downtown by a level. This is Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, and I'm not going to read the whole article if you want to. Again, I'll leave a link in the description. But here it says, at some point in time, possibly between 1875 and 1905, which, yeah, 1890 is right in the middle of that, Chattanooga built up its roads and abandoned the first stories of the buildings in the downtown of the city. This is why when people comment on my channel telling me that all of these basement level windows were were built there originally because they were always the basement. You know, they were never the first floor, but no, a lot of them were the first floor. Um, I also have to say, it's funny. Someone from another channel must have mentioned me in a derogatory way because I have so many people commenting on my video about the, the Titans and the mud, mud fossils and melted buildings, that, that video. So many people commenting on that with very snide comments. So I actually want to thank the person who sent me there because I'm getting a lot more views on that. So thank you. But yeah, I think that's what happened. You know, you've made it when people send their trolls after you. Anyway, um, 
Now, anyway, that's I got distracted. At some point in time, possibly between 1875 and 1905, Chattanooga built up its roads and abandoned the first stories of the buildings in the downtown of the city, turning them into basements. Today, no one knows exactly why or how it happened. The popular theory is that Chattanooga raised its city a story to escape the devastating flooding the Tennessee River wrought every few years. So they don't know. They don't know why. The, the, the town was built on top of another town, and you always have to wonder where do they get all of that fill? You know, how do they fill up all those roads, depending on how big the downtown was? Um, but again, we, we have something else strange happening right around that time period. We also have, in 1890, that the census records were destroyed by fire. So there you go again. You know, 1890 and destruction, they, they seem to go hand in hand. And lastly, before actually talking a little bit more about the lost generation, um, I just wanted to show you. So as you can see up here, this is from um, a website about Ellis Island. And if this was on a timeline. So as you can see here, again, if you want to read through it, you can go back and read through it. But 1893 to 1902, so again, right in that time period, on June 15th, 1897, with 200 immigrants on the island, a fire breaks out in one of the towers in the main building and the roof collapses. Though no one is killed, all Ellis Island records dating back to 1840 and the Castle Garden era are destroyed. So not only do we have all of these strange things happening, but we also have some pretty substantial records being destroyed, usually by fire. So we have first the 1890 census, and now we have the, the records being destroyed on Ellis Island. And so I, I think that a lot of it ties back to many of the people that we do look at as being that I look at at least, I can't say we, cause I don't know if I speak for you, but yeah, I would look at that as the lost generation. So here are some children from the orphan train. Um, there were tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, I believe. We'll go back and read a little bit about that then. Actually, let's just do that right now. Oh, that's not even it. Let me find it. Okay. So the orphan train movement was a supervised welfare program that transported children from crowded eastern cities of the United States to foster homes located largely in rural areas of the Midwest. The orphan trains operated between 1854 and 1929, relocating about 250,000 children. The co-founders of the orphan train movement claimed that these children were orphaned, abandoned, abused, or homeless but this was not always true. They were mostly the children of new immigrants and the children of the poor and destitute families living in these cities. So if you're gonna talk about a lost generation, yeah, this isn't only 1890, but it still falls right in that area. And it falls, a lot of the children do fall into that time period that they are called the lost generation. And if any children were certainly lost, it would be those in the orphan train movement. And you have to wonder, Yes, they do have some some reasons that they were orphaned or abandoned, abused, homeless. 250,000 children, though? I, I can't help but wonder if, if there really was another reason that there were all of these children. It just doesn't make sense to me. That is a lot, a lot of children. Um, there were an estimated, here it says, 30,000 in New York City alone in the 1850s in foster homes. So there's more to the story that they're not telling us. Here's just another photo of some children on the orphan train. And I have to say that I think that it's really interesting that I watched a documentary about the orphan train and there were people from this one town and they were trying to get the records. They were trying to get the actual names of their parents. They had arrived there. They were adopted by, by families, but they wanted to know who their real families were. And a couple of the people actually had the same last name. And at least in the documentary, they didn't make the connection that they could possibly be related. But I found it strange that, yeah, there were a lot, that there were children with the same last name. And I also found out that a lot of these kids, they didn't even really know their last name. Um, they would assign them a last name. Say if they were found at a church, they would give them the last name church. Um, if they, you know, were, were given or found, you know, maybe by a blacksmith shop, they would be given the last name Smith or, you know, Walker or just 
they, they were just kind of assigned generic names having to do with how they were found or how they ended up there. So even, even though people may search for their ancestry, those who were in the orphan trains, a lot of times they won't actually find it because this isn't their real last name. And even uh, my own personal story is that my grandfather, he would not, he, he, his last name was Wilson, but he wouldn't tell anyone his real last name. So apparently Wilson was not his real last name. He wouldn't tell anyone his real last name. And that's just another story from that whole generation. So many mysteries, so many questions that we have that it seems like they just, they're not going to be answered. So here are some other children from the orphan train movement, all lined up looking spiffy. And this was the first one that I showed you. Here are a bunch of them posing on the orphan train. What a photo op. A bunch of orphans who are getting ready to be shipped off to foster homes. Look at the poses. I don't know. It, it just, it seems so surreal. And then on top of that, we have the incubator babies. Have you ever heard of the incubator babies? Yes. Well, we'll get back to her later. Let me see. Here we go. Baby incubators from Boardwalk Sideshow to Medical Mar Marvel. In the, late eight, eight, sorry, in the late 19th century, thousands of premature babies' lives were saved while attracting oglers at amusement parks. And so that's the man who was said to have saved the lives of babies. But yeah, they were a common sideshow in the late 19th and early 20th century incubator babies and they will tell you that they were placed there because the hospitals didn't want to use the incubators so it was you know to to keep these infants alive but they they were actually shown around like circus freaks here we have some people standing in front of it says in, infant incubators and these were at the world's fairs infant incubators with living infants I sure hope that they're living because I would hope they wouldn't show any other kind of infants. But again, I always mention how impeccably dressed they were in these times. And I have to say that a lot of times I wonder how staged these things were. We, I mean, we stage photos nowadays anyway, but there are a lot of people who even believe that these, these were just actors and actresses who put on period clothing to kind of um, push through a narrative. I don't know if that's true or not, but I certainly wouldn't put anything past anyone. But so there's one. And then here's some people going through. I think this was at Coney Island and they are just spectators going through to look at all the babies in the incubators. Babies that a lot of times you have to wonder where did they actually come from? And a lot of people will mention that you could adopt these babies from the incubators. And I have, I so far, I haven't been able to find a whole lot of evidence supporting that people could just go and adopt these babies. But I do know that it happened because here we have an actress. Her name was Marie Dressler. And yeah, she, she adopted an incubator baby. So this was in 1904. And it says, Marie Dressler adopts a baby. It's a Coney Island incubator mite and is to be brought up in style and bear the actress's name. So here we do have one newspaper article about an actress, and she was a rather famous actress who adopted an incubator baby. Here she's mentioned in another newspaper, so Colorado Historic Newspapers Collection, and it just mentions right here what it says here. Marie, here, oh, is it Dressier or is it Dressler? I think they just spelled it wrong. Let me go back and see. It is Dressler, okay. So Marie Dressler, the actress, has adopted one of those incubator babies, and her press agent will now have something substantial to work on. So here again, you know, it, it is shown that one of these incubator babies was indeed adopted. So it just raises the question of going back to the lost generation of individuals born between 1883 and 1900. And yeah, not all of the years add up exactly right but how how often are we not told the truth about our timeline or lots of other stuff but you know it all seems that so many of these strange things happen right around the same time so we've got 
strange destructive things going on in the landscape. We've got new populations of people going in to different towns. We have records in certain towns like my town that are first starting to be kept in the 1880s and the 1900s. Then you have other records like from 1890 or from Ellis Island that were destroyed. Um, and at Ellis Island, they were destroyed all the records from 1840 up to, I think it was the 1890s when that, when that happened. And then you have the orphan trains and we have the incubator babies. And, you know, you just can't help but wonder, was there something else? Who really was the lost generation? I can understand calling it the lost generation having to do with World War I, but as most of us know, who, who know how things work, there's, there's always another meaning underneath things that a lot of times we have to dig for. And I think this is one of those times, you know, we, we've got Generation X, we've got Gen Z, we have the baby boomers and the lost generation. And it just so happens to be during the time that records are being lost, places are being destroyed, and yeah, it seems like some sort, people are coming out of some sort of reset. Some sort of renewal is happening. And all of a sudden we have these children popping up and we're wondering, where did all these kids come from? Who were their parents? What happened to their parents? I don't know. Anyway, that's all that I have for you today. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed and would like to hear more of what I have to say, I would love if you would do that. If you have any questions or comments, you can leave one either here or over on Instagram. And if you like my work and would like to check out my Patreon page, I will leave a link in the description box for that as well. And I hope you have a great day.